And uh, let me first summarize, not only summarize, but make a few comments to complement what we saw last time. So if you saw in the notes, I added a chapter in between one and two. I called it intermezzo, which a few with these comments that I'm going to make uh, now. OK, very good. So yesterday, I told you that the action for particles in some space can be given as follows. If you have a metric, you compute an infinitesimal length for the for the particle that goes along some curve parameterized by z of t. And if you integrate that infinitesimal length, you get the total length. And that if you extremize that total length, you, are be, you will be studying geodesics between points a and b. Does it matter how you parameterize the curve? What is z of t? If you pick z of t and use t from 0 to 1, another person goes and uses t squared that also goes from 0 to 1. Does it matter? No. It's parameterization invariant, as we saw. It's the length that's physical. Then I told you that this square root is nasty. Let's work instead without a square root. It's better. You just remove the square root, and it's the same thing. Okay? And how did we see it's the same thing? We said, write the equations of motion for the starting action. Explore the fact that you can put any parameterization to pick this clever parameterization, where the proper velocity is equal to 1. In other words, where the time that you are measuring is the length up to that point P of the curve. And if you do that, then the equations simplify a lot. And in fact, they are the equations that follow from this section. And this was in a bunch of exercises. OK, let's derive this in a different way that's not in the notes that complements a little bit that derivation. What I'm going to do today, in the, before with the, lecture, the proper lecture to starts, is going, are going to be comments that, as you see, are very generic and apply for any space with any metric. We are going to make comments about spaces that are flat or not for any space. But of course, the main topic of the lectures are not all the space times and general relativity and so on, but just ADS. But still, some people ask these questions, and I think it's nice to complement a little bit with this. So let's show that these two are equivalent in a different way by introducing yet another action. Let me call it Polyakov uh, prime. I mean, it's not exactly Polyakov, but it almost looks like Polyakov, which I define like this. It's one half of the very same integral, dt, gij, z dot i, z dot j. But I multiply by some new field e. So this Polyakov action is going to be a function of the coordinates, the velocities, and also this new field E, but not of the velocity of this field E, just the field E, plus 1 over E, 1 over this field. So that's a new action that I define. It's a definition. Now, first claim is that this action with the new field is equivalent to Nambugoto. So they are the same. They are equivalent. OK, why? How do we see that these two are the same? That's easy to show that they are equivalent. Since we have, at the classical level, since we have no e dot, since there is no derivative with respect to time of e, e is not a dynamical field. And so the equations of motion for e, delta, delta e are trivial. What do they give? They give this factor. Let me call it just z dot square. This factor here I define as z dot square. Derivative with respect to e gives 1 minus 1 over e square equals 0. In other words, the equations of motion for e, they imply that e is equal to 1 divided by the square root of z dot square. Do you agree? Is it correct? But if you plug e equal to this here, look what happens. Here you get z dot square. You divide by the square root, so you get square root. Here you get square root again. You have a factor of 1 half. You get exactly back to Nambugot. OK? So they are the same. Yes?
Yes? No, because your starting point is not obviously a length of a curve. OK. Besides, it would be included in what I'm doing, because what I'm doing is true for any space. Right? So it would not be a derivation, and it would be, if it were, it would be included here. OK, so we saw that these actions are equivalent, because E is not dynamical, and if I eliminate it, I go back to Nambugoto. OK. Now, let's show that it's also the same as Polyakov. And once we will do this, then, of course, we establish that the two are the same. Right? If it's equivalent to Nambugoto and also to Polyakov, then Nambugoto and Polyakov are equivalent. So how do we see now that it's equivalent to Polyakov? Well, you see that the fact that they are equivalent, remember, there was a parameterization invariance, right? There was a freedom of choosing t goes to f of t. So this action, being exactly equivalent to this, better have that symmetry, right? So how does it work under parameterizations? So under t goes to some function f of t, this action naively is not invariant like we saw. That one is not, definitely. Because t transforms, z dot transforms, but because there's no square root, you get one transformation from here, two from here, and it doesn't work out. But that's easy. Under transformations, let E transform like dt. So let E transform into f dot times E. Then uh, this action, now it's invariant under parameterization. You see that this is invariant now. And 1 over E transforms as dt, so it's also invariant. So perfect. Now the action is invariant under parameterizations. So that means that this action has a symmetry that I can pick my parameterization. And so under this symmetry, I have the right to pick E equal 1. I just choose my metric along my curve to be 1. And if I do it, then this, up to a trivial constant that I don't care, becomes equal to this. And so I establish that this is equal to Polyakov. But Polyakov was not just this. It was this with the condition that the proper velocity was 1. Right? But I also get that because, you see, E is just this. So for this to be 1, Z dot needs to be 1. So I do get exactly Polyakov with the constraint. OK? And so that's a way of establishing that these two actions are equivalent. OK? It's a bit more elegant than the way in the notes, but a bit more sophisticated, but it's exactly equivalent. OK. And any question here? OK, so let me go on with the general remarks. One uh, nice set of coordinates we had for the sphere were these stereographic coordinates. Given a point on the sphere, we had a map to a point u on the plane at z equals 0, at x d plus 1 equals 0, by passing a line through the north pole that passes by the sphere and intersects that plane. That map is one-to-one, -one, right? If you give me a point on the plane, any point on the plane, you just draw a line that goes up to the North Pole, and that gives me a point on the sphere. Right? So given a point on the sphere, you get a point on the plane. Given a point on the plane, you get a point on the sphere. So it's nice to parameterize the sphere as if the sphere was plane, was flat, by using these u-coordinates. And then the metric in u-coordinates looks like flat times a factor. That factor is important. I emphasized that that factor goes to 0 at infinity, meaning that at infinity, arcs have very little length. And that makes sense, because infinity is just a point on the sphere. It is just the North Pole. right? So it better be that distances in these coordinates at very large u go to 0, and indeed, everything works out. Then I said these words that these space times in d dimensions that are proportional to flat space are not flat, like flat space is, but they are conformally flat. And there were some questions about how general is this? Are all space times conformally flat? Can I write, if I have a space time, can I pick coordinates and make it conformally flat? Are they conformally flat or not? 
And uh, that was a question that I wanted to mention a few words about it. Okay. So, so le let's discuss that. Let me just say what the answer to that is. And it's very simple. But first, let me write an example. Suppose I give you this metric, which is, for example, something like uh, this, 9x to the 4 dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. And those that did not read the notes, those that read the notes don't answer. But if you did not check the last version of the notes, could you try to tell me what would this space-time be? Okay. Right. So it looks like a space-time where two directions are isotropic, and this direction is different, right? One direction is kind of contracted. So particles, they will not draw straight geodesics. They will draw curved geodesics, right, in this space, in these coordinates. That's true. Someone else wants to make any remark about this metric? This is 9. This is 9, not a g. So you are suggesting to write x prime equal to? So x prime equal 3x squared, not? Try again. I put nice vectors so that this would be easy. You are going the right direction. Can someone try to help? 3x cubed, you are going the right direction. 3x squared, more or less, almost. I hope I did not do a mistake. I think it's OK, yeah. Anyone else? We already have all the ingredients there. Who? <laughs> x cubed. We have a winner. Very good. x cubed. Then dx prime is 3x squared dx. And so, if I s and so this metric, ds squared, is just dx prime squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. And so this is actually just flat space. It is just flat space with some crappy coordinates. Right? Someone gave you some very silly coordinates where it looks like, and it's true that in those coordinates geodesics bend, but if you were to compute lengths between geodesics, you would see that uh, if they start constant, they remain constant. If they are growing, they grow linearly. Everything would be physical, and you would conclude that this is flat space. So, so this space is the same as this space, of course, which are flat. And so if you just give me a metric, you see, you have to be careful that uh, in this space-time geodesics, if I have x prime and y, I just draw any straight line. But if I go to y and x, this same line would be something bent. I don't know if I bent it correctly. But, uh, and here it doesn't look flat, but it is still flat. So how would I know if a, ma if a metric is flat? And the statement is that metric being flat is the same as Riemann, the curvature Riemann being 0. Okay? So you compute Riemann, you check that Riemann is 0, and this will tell you that it's flat. And indeed, physically, if you are, can you read if I write here? Can everyone read? So if you are an observer and you see a piece of dust passing by you, right? and these are some congruence of geodesics that are passing by you, the family of geodesics parameterized by some parameter, S, and if you were to ask for the vector, this delta x, that gives the separation of geodesics, how are they spreading? You probably have, you might have seen this following beautiful deviation equation that says that there is some derivative of this delta x as time evolves, how things are going away from you, time, the, the tau is your time, which would be equal to this Riemann tensor contracted with delta x with the velocity of the dust and the velocity of the dust. 
So I see it's a vector, I contract with three vectors, I still get a vector, and you get this type of equation. So when Riemann is zero, it says that things just, if, 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 if you have a, a ball of dust that's stopped, it continues to be stopped. If it's growing, it grows linearly, right? X double dot is zero, so it just grows linearly. In particular, it implies the following equation, that the volume is equal to something like Ricci contracted with x dot, x dot. And so a volume of this dust, if it starts growing, it keeps growing linearly, and, uh, and that's how things would uh, behave. OK? Now, <clears throat> good. Now, if you have this piece of dust, that's like a sphere. Fine, now you know how this piece of dust evolved, the volume. But you see that the shape could also change. It could be, go from a sphere to being some kind of ellipsoid and so on. Right? So Riemann, this object, Riemann, can be written as a tensor that's called while. That's the C, I, J, K, L, plus traces that are stuff that involves the Ricci tensor and the metric. In other words, wild is the trace-free pa part of, of Riemann. So if you have Riemann, it's a tensor. The, the part that has no trace, but otherwise has the same symmetry properties of Riemann, is called while. And the information, the info that is not this volume kind of information is encoded in while. So, so part of the information about volume is Riemann. The rest, about shapes and so on, the more sophisticated information is while. OK? But in equations, like I said, Riemann is equal to while plus traces. So there are some, something like G, I, K, uh, Ricci, K, L, J, plus, dot, dot, dot. A bunch of stuff such that this is the trace-free the trace -free part of, of Riemann. So it's a, a, another curvature tensor. OK? Notice that if you are in the vacuum, Einstein equations will tell you that Ricci is equal to 0 and so on. And so C will still remain, but the other stuff will go to 0. And so if you have, for example, a gravity wave or a black hole, you will have C even though you are in the vacuum, right? So it still remains. And the metric is conformally flat. This is equivalent to while being equal to zero. This is true in, okay? And so that's the answer to some question that someone asked during the class. And just to complement one more thing about while, while is a nice tensor that has the property that if two matrices are proportional to each other, then their while tensors are the same. So of course, if one metric is proportional to flat space, flat space has Riemann equals zero, so everything is zero, so C is zero, and therefore C needs to be zero. So conformally flat clearly implies C equals zero, and uh, and that's uh, and actually it's equivalent. They are equivalent. Any, okay. So do you understand this equation? Here now it's this is Riemann. It has four indices. This is Ricci. It has two indices. This is a scalar. So I better get rid of all the indices, and I do it by contracting with the velocity. So this tells me how does the volume change if I know the velocity field that's passing by me. It's, yeah, it's just what it is. OK? If you don't know GR, you might not know some of the statements I made. It might not be clear that in the vacuum, Riemann becomes wild. It might not be clear that Ricci has two indices and Riemann has four. That's not relevant for these lectures. For these lectures, we are given a metric, and we don't need to know how we found that metric, that we did it by solving some Einstein equations, and that was something dynamical that gave us this space-time. 
we just live in that space time and we throw geodesics and pieces of chalk and pens and so on in that space time. Yes? That's totally orthogonal to the lectures. I'm not going to go there. But let me just uh, say what a wild transformation is. It would be a transformation where you do a local rescaling at each point of space time. So you could say, I have a space time, and I decide that at each point of space time, I multiply it by some rescaling factor. That's clearly what you do to transform flat space into a sphere. You multiply by this factor at each point of space time. So flat space, if you do a local rotation at each point, becomes a sphere. If a theory doesn't care about local rescalings, then the theory on the sphere and on flat space would have the same physics. That's the case when you have a critical theory without a scale and so on, like we said last time. Conformal transformations are not relevant for anything written here, so I will abstain from, telling, from discussing them. But if you want, you can ask me at the end. Uh, more questions? Good question, I don't know. Yeah, the question is, so this matrix being proportional implies same wild answer. Same wild answer, does it imply matrix are proportional? I'm not sure. I know that being zero implies that it's conformally flat. Okay. Good. Last thing, and uh, someone asked me about problem 16. And I want to go over, because it's an important problem, and it's a simple problem, and uh, it highlights some of the things that, uh, it summarizes well some of the things that we learned. So the question is to study this yellow geodesic that goes from North Pole to the equator, compute its length, but using stereographic coordinates. We already did partially in the lecture, right? So let's do it. So first of all, we can say that this axis is axis 1, so I can set u2, u3, and so on to 0. And then the Lagrangian becomes the Lagrangian just for u1, which is very simple, just this Lagrangian. OK? That's what that becomes. Now, moreover, this Lagrangian is complemented with this velocity condition. Now, this velocity condition must be compatible with this Lagrangian. I cannot impose things that are not compatible. What do I mean by this? From this Lagrangian, instead of writing this equation, which is a very powerful equation because it, now I have u dot equal a function of u, I can just solve it. I can find everything from this equation. I don't need the equations of motion. The equations of motion is something like u dot dot equal to something. I don't need that. u dot is much simpler than u dot dot. Who wants uh, u dot dot if you can have u dot? But they must be compatible. And indeed, this is a conserved charge because the action doesn't depend explicitly on time. And therefore, when you take derivative with respect to time of this conserved charge, here you get 0. Here you get something that has u dot dot. And it better be the, just the equations of motion. And indeed, it is. So you don't need the equations of motion because you get this, which is more powerful than the equations of motion. Now you take square root of this formula, and you get that the integral of that element from r to infinity gives you the integral of dt. That integral gives pi r over 2. Remember? Dario even said that it's hard to tell without mathematics and so on, that you have to compute this integral and see that you get pi r over 2. And then that means that the difference in t is pi r over 2. But time is the same as the length. And so the length is pi r over 2. OK, so that's the solution to the problem. OK, okay. But by the way, this integral is actually very easy to compute without mathematics and without knowing any formula. So let me just compute it quickly. So this integral, if I rescale r, it's r times the integral from 1 to infinity dy over y squared plus 1. Do you agree? And now you notice that this integral is the following. So you are integrating from 1 to infinity. 
But the integral is invariant under inversion. That sends y to 1 over y. So if you integrate from 0 to 1, it's the same as from 1 to infinity. If you do y to 1 over y, you can see by head, right, that it's invariant. This peaks a 1 over y squared. This peaks a 1 over y squared. It's invariant. So this integral from 1 to infinity is the same as from 0 to 1. It's also the same from minus 1 to 0. It's also the same from minus infinity to minus 1. And so this integral is r over 4 times the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of the same thing, which is dy over y plus i times y minus i. This is just a way of writing y squared plus 1. And now you are integrating in the real line a function that has a pole at y equal i and y equal minus i. So you just pick the residue at y equal i. You get 2i. You multiply 2i by 2 pi i, and therefore you get r pi over 2. There was a 2 that I forgot. OK? Is it clear? Did you follow the algebra? It's, it's easy, right? You pick the residue at y equal i, you multiply by 2 pi i, but here when y equal to i, you get 2i. So 2 pi i over 2i gives pi. And so you get r times 2 over 4 times pi is r pi over 2. OK, so we don't need Mathematica. <laughs> we can solve everything. OK, very good. So, so this problem 16 is quite important. If this type of manipulations with geodesics and so on is very important. So let me know if there's any question here. Problem 17 is similar. Again, you, have, you are doing it with angles. Most angles you can set to 0. Then you get a simple Lagrangian for one of the angles, very simple Lagrangian for one variable. You don't need the equations of motion. The charge is enough. You can check if you want that the derivative gives the equations of motion. You integrate, and so on, and so on. And it's basically the same thing. OK, very important exercises to do. OK. Good. So now, let's introduce ADS. So let's start with the sphere. Let's remember the sphere. SD was the set of points x square that leave x, that leave in R d plus 1, such that x 1 square plus, plus x d plus 1 square is equal to plus r squared. Now, this combination here, of course, is nothing but x a, x b times the flat matrix delta a b in r d plus 1. And so what we have here is just that this is the flat matrix in r d plus 1. And so we just have that the length square is equal to r square. Now, there are many things that we could change here. We could change Euclidean space. We could replace this by, for example, Minkowski space, r1, comma, d. Right? So this would have time and d dimensions. Or we could also do some funny space, r2, comma, d minus 1, which would have two times. Now, two times looks very weird, right? To have a space where there are two times. Why not? It's weird. Uh, but it could be. Our space could be embedded with a space with two times or with one time. For example, if it was this space with two times, that would mean that we are now going to define an object. OK, I'm, I'm going to give the spoiler. That object is ADS, d-dimensional, which is the set of points x that now live in this space that has two times. You see, 2 plus d minus 1 is still d plus 1, like before, such that now the metric here, it was the metric 1, 1, 1. Now it's going to become the metric minus 1, minus 1, 1, 1, 1, and so on. 
So many spaces and two times. So such that minus the first component, it's conventional to call it minus one component. We start counting from minus one. Minus x zero component square and the other ones with plus, plus x one square plus dot 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 plus x d uh, how many in total? I want d plus one. So it would be d plus one, then it would be d, then d minus one. Okay. d minus one square is equal to a constant. And this combination here, by the way, is nothing but now the metric, but with eta a, b, x, a, x, b. And now when you are dealing with Lorentzian, when the metric is fixed, it can be positive, zero, or negative, depending if your vector is time-like, null, or space-like, right? Right, it can be, uh, and here we pick it to be minus r square. So you see that this is one generalization. There are many generalizations. We picked one. So there were a couple of things we could have done. Here, we could have chosen plus or minus sign. It was up to us. Do we want to embed it in something space-like, time-like? We could even put zero if we want. That was a choice. Another choice was to say, I want two times. So I put one and another one. And you could put just one time. Then it would be minus, plus, 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 plus. That would be another surface embedded there. Now, all these surfaces, all these examples, all these space times, have a, the same symmetry, roughly, which is basically rotations, SOD plus one. Except that because they are Lorentzian, it's not SO d plus 1, it's SO1, comma d, SO2, comma d plus 1. It's just the same rotation, but with a bunch of i's, in the same way that rotations and boosts are roughly the same thing, just an i that you put in some cosine becomes cosh, and so on. Is it okay? Everyone knows that like a rotation matrix or a boost is roughly the same thing. In the same way, all these space times, they have this symmetry. That is a symmetry that if you have, what's the definition of this symmetry is, I want a, a symmetry that preserves the dot product. In other words, that if I transform x under lambda x and y under lambda y, my dot product x dot y would transform into x and then there would be some lambda transpose eta lambda y. And so if you want this to be invariant, you want this to be still the metric. And this is the definition. Did someone object? No? Good, because it, this is correct. So, so uh, eta would be equal to this. And so this would be the definition. So that's the definition of SOD. If eta is just the Kronecker delta, it would be the definition of SO d minus 1 comma 1 when we have one time. And it will be the definition of SO d minus 2 comma 2 when we have two times. So here, these are just rotations. And here, it's the Lorentz group that has rotations and boosts. OK. So these space times, from that point of view, they have this symmetry. But how should we think of them? How do we think of these space times? So in the problems, you are encouraged to think of the three-dimensional case. Three-dimensional case, you have here three dimensions. So it's a two-dimensional surface. And you can play with picking signs here, picking signs here, and you plot all these possibilities. And you get various different curves that you can draw in three dimensions. You just draw the axes x minus 1, x0, and x1, and you plot the various surfaces. Okay, with various choices here, minus, plus, or zero, right? And it's useful to plot. Let's do just ADS here, and you can do in the problems the other ones. All these spaces are interesting, but we are going to draw now ADS in the same way that we would draw a sphere. Okay, okay. 
So let's draw, let's draw ADS2. ADS2 we can draw because it's a space in three dimensions, so it's very easy to draw. Let's draw this axis, x0, x minus 1, and x1. These guys are times This guy is a space coordinate. And now we want to draw the surface minus x0 square minus x minus 1 square plus x1 square equal to minus r square. OK, so it's very easy to draw this surface. So it's easier maybe to draw to see it like this. Just multiply everything by minus 1 and pass this to the other side. So you see that these guys, they have a circle whose radius increases as x1 increases. When x1 is 0, it's a circle of radius r. Otherwise, the circle increases. So this is just an hyperboloid. I just have a circle here. This radius is r. And then when x1 increases, it is hyperbolic growth. Similarly, if x1 is negative, it grows in the other direction. And now we have a two-dimensional surface. So this surface here, this is ADS2. Okay. Of course, by comparison, we can put here a sphere which is S2. OK. Now, a sphere, a geodesics on the sphere, are equators. So this here is a geodesic. How do I get another geodesic? What's another geodesic? You can rotate. So other geodesics can be obtained from this one by rotating. If I rotate this by some angle theta, I get another geodesic. And this geodesic is obtained by doing, by taking the yellow geodesic and applying to this geodesic some rotation matrix. And everything in the sphere is the same. There's no special points, as Raoul emphasized yesterday. All points are more or less the same. With the symmetry, you can rotate any point to any other point. All geodesics are the same. It's very, very symmetric. Now, here it looks a bit different, naively. It's not, but it looks different, in the sense that it looks like these points are smaller, and then it grows. Right? But of course, the definition of Lorentz is the statement that this condition is invariant under rotations and boosts. This one here. Right? So if you go from x to x prime, which are coordinates that are rotated or boosted, in x prime, the condition takes exactly the same form. Right? So the space time for all observables related by rotations and boosts looks exactly the same. Right? So it has the same symmetry. You just rotate. Careful, because there are some minus signs, but it's the same thing as in the sphere. We are going to come back to this point. But let me emphasize one more point, which was that here, you see this nice thing, that geodesics in the sphere are also the intersection of the sphere with these simple planes. Right? You take a plane and you cut the sphere by a plane that passes by the origin, and you get a geodesic. So it, it's fun that this geodesic here is the intersection of x squared equal r squared with a plane that passes by the origin. OK. Now, 
we have a definition of ADS. And we want to now start studying this space. What are geodesics in this space? What would an observer living in this space feel like? And the first thing we should address, the elephant in the room, are these two times. Two times is very scary. What am I doing? Did I lose my mind <laughs> starting to have two times here? Right? Two times is bad. What would an observer in a world that has two times experience? What is this? <laughs> Time tomorrow. There is a tomorrow in one direction, a tomorrow prime in another direction. I mean, oh, <laughs> just uh, it doesn't make any sense, right? So, so two times is not so good. Are you worried about two times? No. You should not be, because you see that here there are three dimensions, but here there are only two. This hyperboloid. Here is two-dimensional object. So what we should check is that in the two-dimensional surface, there's only one time. And we have to see what is time, right? And you see that here, time, in the embedding space, this is time. This is also time. But I'm not allowed to go out of the hyperbolite, right? So if I am at fixed x1, if I am, for example, in this circle, I'm not allowed to go out of this circle. I'm only allowed to rotate in the circle. So what are the two directions here? I have this direction, and I have this direction. So this direction here, you see, for example, at this point, what am I doing? I'm at x0 equal to something, x1 equal to 0, and x minus 1 equal to 0. And in this direction, I'm growing x minus 1. So I'm moving in time. This was time. What about here? Here, I'm going down. At this point, I'm not moving in x minus 1, but I'm moving in x0. Right? And that's the same at all points. At all points, I'm moving only not in both times, but only in a linear combination of these times. So this direction here, this direction is time. Its time is exactly this angle theta, which you can think is a linear combination of two times. Yes? Sorry? Good. So let's come back to this. It's a very important point. He said a cyclic time. Because now we have a time. It's only one time. That's great. But it goes around. Right? That's not great. <laughs> right? We don't want to evolve in time, and then at 24 hours, we get back to zero. Right? And we live again. There is a movie that's like this, right? that he wakes up, every day is the same day. <laughs> that's not good for causality. We solved one problem, but it's still a bit weird that things go back, and as time evolves, things come back. But let's first make sure that we understand this is time, this one here, you see, it's evolving in x1, in space. These vectors are, this is a space-like vector here. This direction is space. Similarly, if I have this point, the tangent vector here, that would move me along this line, these directions would be space. And so in this two-dimensional surface, we have time that goes around and space that goes to the sides. Okay. So these directions are space, and going around is time. Yes? Times are allowed to be negative. You could say this is origin, this is zero, and this is positive, and now this would be negative, going in the other direction. OK. Yes? Good. Great question. So now, um, someone is asking the following question. I have this circle. This circle, by the way, notice that it's the intersection of the hyperboloid by a plane. Right? And you are asking, could I do a boost 
that rotates this plane, and I have a new circle, and I call that new thing time. You can. That is just a Lorentz transformation. Those vectors are all time-like. That's just saying that if I have two observers, they have different times. Like in flat space, no one says time needs to be vertical. Another spacecraft says time is that. What's crucial is that the both vectors are time-like. So there are some time-like vectors here, and there are some space-like vectors. Right? But, the, but there is with one time-like and one space-like, you parameterize everything. And so the space has one time, one space. But you are anticipating an important point, which is this rotation, these boosts. And uh, they will play a role in a second. Yes? Yes, time is theta. Yeah. Time is theta. OK. Very good. So we need to solve one more problem. We have this surface as one time, one space. That's good for an ADS2. But time is periodic. Right? So what can you do that when you go around, things are not periodic? Where have you seen this object? that uh, you, you go around and you don't come back to the same thing, if you follow that. Where have you seen this object? In the bathroom, right? Like toilet paper, right? <laughs> so, okay? So what you can do is unwrap this hyperboloid. You can say that the correct picture I'm going to say is like this. I have my hyperboloid. And I'm going to think of it like a roll of toilet paper, where when I go, I start here, for example. This would be the end of the toilet paper. And then I go around, around, around. But then I am just continuing. Around, 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 many times. OK, this could be the end in this particular case. Well, And similarly here. Okay. And so now you see that as you go around, you just say that as you go around, you keep going around, but then you are not at the same position. You are further and further down in this row. In other words, mathematically it's exactly the same, but this angle, theta, that was time, is not to be identified with time plus 2 pi. We just drop this periodic identification, saying, and that's, that's, that's it, right? That's how we transform. In the same way that imagine you start with a cylinder. This is a cylinder. A cylinder, it's just, or in, if you want a more conventional cylinder, it's this, right? This is a cylinder. And in a cylinder, you say the cylinder, I can draw it like this, where if this is 0, this is 2 pi, and this line is identified. How do I go from this to an infinite strip? I just remove this identification. Right? I just say that now, as I go, I come back here, but I'm in a different sheet. And then I'm just saying that an infinite strip is a sequence of squares. And I go from this point to this point, then to this point, but they are not the same. There's no identification. Yes? No, that's in because here real toilet paper is going in. But uh, this is infinitely thin toilet paper that uh, it's, all, it's all on top of each other. This, this, this third direction I drew here just for illustration purpose. Right? It's just like a line uh, that you create many copies. You don't need a thickness. Right. Yes. No, that's a definition. It's not. A, we can. Uh, it's definition. We. We just. I'm defining ADS. So I. Def I finished ADS. The definition of ADS now would be, ADSD, is equal to this set of points. Okay, that's true. Uh, and then I would put some tilde, on top. And this tilde would stand for some covering. 
I could put some fancy words. I have some enveloping covering, blah, 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 blah. But in practice, it just means what we understood now. I just go around and I don't come back to myself. That defines now, another definition would be without doing this, but then I have closed time-like curves. And then it's not a reasonable space-time, it's a toy that we can play. But now that I got rid of time-like curves, I have a space where I can go infinitely to the future, infinitely to the past, where I can go to the left and where I can go to the right. So it starts to look like a box. Right? I have time that goes, and I can go to the left, and I can go to the right. Any question? Yes? Can you say again? Mathematically? The cyclic part that is problematic is this one because it's time. Let me take that. Was it clear? The question uh, was, uh, yeah, uh, go on. Yeah, so a, a, an observer stand here. If it doesn't do anything, time evolves and later it will be here. Like in space time, if I have flat space time and I put this chalk here, the chalk keeps moving in time, right? It's not st standing still. Okay, so now let's. Uh, yeah, today we'll not do everything I wanted to do. Okay, that's fine. So let's see what we are learning here. We are learning that there is time here. And here there is space. And this here at infinity, you could say, is the boundary of my space-time, or you could call it the end of my space-time, right? I go, 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 I go to the end. And you see that there is a right boundary and the left boundary, okay? And that's fine, because like we said, this is roughly a cylinder, and when I cut open a cylinder, there is a left boundary and there is a right boundary. So being in a box in two dimensions, if you live in two dimensions, you have the wall on the right and the wall on the left. Okay? So here we have the right boundary and here you have the left boundary. And so in this case, our box in 2D is a strip where I have stuff inside, and this is the left, and this is the right. Now, a box in 3D is not like this. It's rather one single boundary. There's only one boundary, and inside, like I said, I can put stuff, like a bottle of wine and so on. Right? And so here, in 3D, there is only one boundary. So we already understood what this space-time is, but here we have two boundaries, and let's think a little bit about ADS-3. So this was ADS-2. Let's think about ADS-3. Now, ADS-3, it's not possible to draw because I need four dimensions. So ADS3 would be given by the following, minus x minus 1 square minus x0 square plus x1 square plus x2 square equal to minus r square. And now I can only draw sections of this space. I need to ignore one of the coordinates and plot the other three. Right? If I want to draw plot, that's the best I can do. Maybe I could use colors and so on, but without uh, being... Simple-minded, I draw sections of this space. 
So if, for example, we said x2 equal to 0, then uh, what figure should I draw? The same. Right? So if x2 equal to 0, I draw the same figure. If x1 equal to 0, what do I draw? The same. Right? OK. So it looks like the picture is the same. The only thing I should do, if I want to do ADS3, I should say, let's think of this as kind of the x, the other directions. If I'm doing ADS, d, where d is bigger than 2. But it's otherwise the same picture. Now, you see that this is, the, now here is a puzzle for you. Now it looks like you are saying ADS is roughly the same, and it has the right boundary and the left boundary. That's not true. So what am I missing? Why is this a bit misleading? Everything is correct that I said, but it is not true that I have two boundaries. I only have one. So what should I draw more? Sorry? Uh, what did you say? Uh, again, someone else? No, the, the radius doesn't matter. Just, just make the picture bigger or smaller than if it's smaller, you cannot see. If it's bigger, I cannot draw. <laughs> that doesn't help, yeah. OK, then we need to see something periodic in space. I need to see the space. So I cannot set them to 0. So instead, let's do another section. Let's set, say, x0 to 0. Let's look at this var variable equal to 0. OK, so now it's a different picture. Now I need to draw the picture minus x minus 1 square plus x1 square plus x2 square equal to r square. So now what is the picture now? Minus r squared. Very good. Important. Minus r squared. So now this picture is quite different. Let me draw it. So now the picture, let this be x0 as it is here. And now let this be x1 and this be x2. What should I draw? Someone said a sphere. A sphere would be these two signs were minus. A cone, someone said. No, not a cone. Uh, so let's try, for example. If these two coordinates are 0, this guy is what? So if these two are 0, these coordinates are r. Is that the only option, r? Minus r as well. OK. And now, this variable, could it be less than r? No, if it's less than r, then when I pass it here, this quantity is negative, and there is no, nothing more. Mm, ah, because I set x0 to 0, right? So let me set a, OK, that's fine. OK, then it should be x minus 1, yeah. So could x minus 1 be smaller than r? No. And when it's bigger than r, when it's 10r, what shape do I get? Well, I get a circle in x1, x2, which is bigger now. And so I get a shape like this. And here I get a shape down like this. And here it's a circle. Well, here like this. Right? And so now you see that it's this point. I can smoothly connect to this point. I just go around my cylinder. I just go around. So there are not two boundaries. It's the same boundary. I can go from this side to this side. It is just that I was not seeing it in this section. But when I see the other section, I see that I can. OK? So in the topology of ADS3 is a box. It's this topology. If I am in one boundary that I thought was the right boundary, I can actually go smoothly to what I thought was the left boundary. I can move in time. Moving in time is just going around the cylinder. That's time. 
And so the topology is exactly the topology of a cylinder. Okay? I can move back and forth in the cylinder. I can move in time. And the boundary has the topology of an S1. In other words, ADS3, the boundary of ADS3 has the topology of time times a circle S1. Okay, So we had before two circles. We had time was a circle, but that one we decompactified and we made it into R. And we have space that's a circle, and that one we did not decompactify. We left it as a circle. So space is periodic because it's a box. I go around the box, I come back to the same point. Time is not periodic. It's like uh, I can move, 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 move from infinite past to infinite future. So the last thing we need to do the next thing we will do next time is to say, okay, it looks like it's a topology of the box. So what I would like to see is to see that it behaves like a box. Namely, if I'm here and I throw some particles, the particles should come back. And geodesics should do something like this in the box. So the next step we have to do, now that we understood that there is a chance, so we understood that ADSD as the topology of a cylinder, of a Lorentzian cylinder, in other words, also known as a box. Next step would be to study geodesics to see what it would be like to live in ADS space-time. Okay, and that's what we are going to do next time because I'm out of time. Okay, very good, thank you.